Hi there, this is a video in the series on the Palpa model, as it's usually called, the psycholinguistic model. In this series, we're just gonna be looking at the model and all of the boxes and arrows and demystifying what do they mean? Uh, how does it apply to undamaged language for single word processing? So hopefully by the end, you have an understanding of each box and, and how, how words are processed. At the very end, there'll be a little test yourself section where you can see whether you understand it enough or you need to do more reading. Typically, you're not gonna get this on your first go. You, you're gonna understand bits and then um, you'll need to rewatch or do some reading on it. And I do suggest some readings at the end as well. So let's get started. Around the edges of this model, there are these inputs and outputs. So if you want to produce language or comprehend language, uh, you're gonna to have to start at the top or bottom of this model. And right in the middle is the semantic system and there's going to be a separate video about this, but essentially that's where the meaning of language is stored and where it interfaces with our knowledge and memory of the world. So to understand something, it needs to start with the inputs and end in the semantic system. To communicate something, we need to start in the semantic system and finish up in one of the outputs. Right, so we are going to start by looking at what it takes to comprehend spoken words, spoken language. So that will start up here and end in the semantic system. First of all, of course, is hearing, but that's not pictured in this model because this is a language model. Um, but obviously you need to be able to hear. And once your brain identifies that these are speech sounds that it's hearing, it's passed to uh, these processes. So the first step, once speech is identified, that it's speech and not music or noise or an animal or something else, is this auditory phonological analysis. What that does is take the signal and find out what phonemes are in it. So similar to the way you might have done this in your course, you're given a spectrogram and you're expected to perhaps pick out what are the phonemes and where do they start and end and what sequence are they in. This can be very difficult to do visually and these are usually recorded without uh, background noise in them. It's a very clean sample, but our brain can rapidly, rapidly do this in the presence of background noise. And that's what this little box does. It identifies phonemes from sound waves despite background noise or accent or rate. Different accents mean that people say, in particular vowels, very differently. But this process in this box will determine that a person was trying to say, um, you know, an e eh or an s, despite a difference between people. Not pictured in this model is also uh, probably a phonological input buffer, and that's essentially auditory working memory. It holds onto that sound after it has been produced uh, to allow that analysis to occur, but um, not so relevant for this model because that's considered, you know, somewhat more of a cognitive process. Although, of course, there's a heap of overlap. Okay, so this, the phonemes are picked out in order. Uh, the words are identified in terms of where one word ends and another begins. And then it's passed to the phonological input lexicon. This is where word recognition occurs. Have I heard this word before? So it's important here that to know that this input lexicon does not contain or does not light up the meaning of a word. It just recognizes that word. So if you take a word that you haven't heard before, like we're gonna make one up, clope. When you pass those phonemes in from your auditory phonological analysis, that process will not light anything up because it doesn't know that word. Whereas if you pass a known word in, clock, as soon as it hears those phonemes in that sequence, it says, yup, this is a known word for us. You can think of this like a library catalog if you're old enough to have actually attended a library in person. You can look up all of the books that are there and it will tell you if it's there or not, but you can't read the book. You can't do access the information inside that book. It's just telling you what's there or perhaps um, a product look up in a store uh, where it will try to find, do we have that item or not? And then if that is a known word and the meaning is understood, that is connected to the meaning in the semantic system where all of the meanings of these words are stored. Now let's talk about what happens when you want to produce your own word spontaneously. So there's no input involved. You are just thinking of something and saying it. So if the idea is hospital, there's a bit of a process that happens here. 
So the conceptual features of the thing you were trying to say lights up and it starts pre-linguistic. You think of an idea and even though it immediately forms words, the, the seed of that idea is not actually in language. Each of the words we know how to produce is mapped to these features. So when you map each one, it's a large building, it's multi-story, it's a medical facility, health professionals work there, unwell people go there. Um, then a lexical semantic entry is lit up that says, yes, we have a word for this concept, here it is. It's very easy for something concrete like that, but sometimes when you are trying to say, trying to express something very kind of abstract and nebulous, you might be thinking, is there a word for this? And you're sifting through those features in your head thinking, is there a word? So that's, that's a time when you can almost feel this process happening in your brain. So that meaning storage then, if there is a word, it will light up in the phonological output lexicon. The phonological output lexicon is much like the phonological input lexicon. It stores the spoken word form. And this is separate from the comprehension of a word. It seems like they should be the same thing, but they're not because they can be differentially impaired. So with our example of hospital, yes, there's a concept for that. And that word sounds like this. So great, we have our concept, we have a word for that concept, what's next? After the phonological output lexicon, we move to the phonological output buffer. Now, depending which model, exact model you're looking at, this is also called phonological assembly or phonological encoding. Sometimes it's separated into more than one step. And realistically, there probably are lots of things happening in this one box. For the purposes of a speech pathologist, um, I mean, I believe it's fine to uh, bind that into just the one box. But briefly, what's probably happening in here is, firstly, there's a buffer that holds the item, the, the phonemes temporarily, uh, the representation of that word, while it assembles the information. So what does that actually look like assembling the information? So if we take our example, there's this word hospital. Well, what needs to be assembled is there are three syllables in this word. The first syllable is stressed. Um, this is how many phonemes are in each syllable. This is where the consonants fit. This is where the vowels fit. And because these ones are unstressed, they might become a schwa. When that goes wrong with, you know, a person without aphasia, it's often when you're tired and you start producing spoonerisms or you insert a phoneme, you know, that assembly is misassembled. So again, there are times where you can kind of feel this process happening or when it's not quite happening right. So phonological output buffer, the phonemes and syllable structure are assembled and then held for production. Then it needs to be programmed. So, you know, we have this conceptual idea of the phonemes and the order, but that needs to be converted into a motor plan. So strictly speaking, this process is not really language, it's motor planning and programming. So a problem in this area actually causes apraxia of speech rather than aphasia per se. So this assembled word is converted into a motor plan of where the articulators should be at any given point. You could think of this a little bit like a Morse code operator. Where someone comes into the, you know, the communications part of a ship and they say, we've got this message, we need to send it. Here it is. And that Morse code operator has to take the you know, English message and turn it into a series of dots and dashes, turn it into a plan. And then that is sent to the articulators and the word hospital is produced. This all happens pretty blindingly fast um, and it feels like it's completely seamless until it stops working normally. So now there are some extra arrows, some bypasses in this section uh, because you can, you can understand a word and then repeat that word without actually knowing what it means. So here are some examples of that for me. I know there is someone called Lady Godiva and I'm not exactly sure who that is, but I've heard it here and there. You know, those things, and you, those words where you think I should look that up and you never do. When someone says that word, I'm able to extract those phonemes and it does light up in my input lexicon because I have heard that word before. I do have a, an entry for that. What I don't have though is any semantic information. I don't know who it is. I can't link that to any uh, memory or knowledge that I have. Similarly with this word innovate, uh, I can extract the phonemes, I recognize it, but I don't have any semantic information. Nonetheless, I can pass that word to my output lexicon, retrieve how it is produced and say it. 
So that is why we have this bypass here where you don't have semantic information, but you can under, you can um, recognize it and produce it. This other bypass is for repeating words that you haven't heard before. Um, but you know, we can make up a string of phonemes or repeat a word from another language or a surname that we've never ever heard before. How do we do that? Well, if we take an example of a, a Russian word, malako, if you've never heard that word before, I bet you can still repeat it. You do that by hearing the phonemes and what order they're produced in. There's no entry in the phonological input lexicon. There's no semantic information. So that is passed directly out to the output buffer where you can hold onto those phonemes, assemble them for yourself, program them and say them. So that is word comprehension and word production in terms of spoken words. Let's now look at reading and writing. First of all, reading. When you see a written word, what is involved? So there are parallels here to speech. First of all, you will look at it and you will understand what the letters are representing. So this box here, visual orthographic analysis, recognizes the letters in a word uh, and it looks past the font or their style or the handwriting to work out what those letters are. There's an extraordinary range of how people's handwriting differs. But despite that, we can look at that and understand the concept that this letter is supposed to be an A, this letter is supposed to be a T. And that's why it's called in some systems abstract letter identification, because it's the abstract concept of the letter. It's not just only recognizing letters when they're exactly written a certain way. The other thing it does is encode the letter order. So for the English, English spelling of jail, it recognizes that it's G-A-O-L, not G-O-A-L. And essentially it determines uh, what is the word and what are the letters inside it. Once that's done, it's passed to the orthographic input lexicon. So this is another parallel to the other lexicons. It is word recognition. It's have I read or seen this word before? So you can kind of feel this working when you think about reading a sentence when you come across a word you don't know. So you get a, yes, I know that word. Yes, I know that word. Yes, yes, yes. And then no. So it's like a little red flag going up in your head where your orthographic input lexicon says, we've never seen this word before. Fails to light anything up. We don't know that word. We haven't seen it before. But supposing you have seen it before, it will then say, okay, we know that word. Here's the connection to what it means. And now we have seen and comprehended a written word. Now the orthographic input lexicon does not care whether a word follows the rules of English. So a word like yacht, uh, you can't sound that out, but that's okay because this process is not sounding anything out. It is recognizing words. So it is seeing the sequence and it is Y-A-C-H-T. Oh yes, that's the word yacht. We know that word. And this is what it means. It's a sailing um, vessel craft. What about a word that we've seen before, but we don't understand or don't know the meaning of it? So that word innovate, we see it, we recognize the letters in order, we pass that to the orthographic input lexicon. Yes, have seen this word, but no, there's no connection. We don't know what it means. Now, if we want to say that word without the semantic system, we need to pass it to the output lexicon via a different route. So there's there's a side path here that passes it to the phonological output lexicon where the production, the spoken production of that word is stored. So it says, yes, that word is pronounced like this. Uh, then those phonemes are assembled, etc. A motor plan is produced and we can say that word. So that's what that arrow is there for. Let's look at a slightly different case now, a word that we haven't ever seen before, but we come across it on a page. This word bimble, we see it, we recognize these letters, but there is no entry in the input lexicon. How then would we be able to read that out loud? Well, there's another path here called orthographic to phonological conversion, or you might say letter to sound conversion. It uses the rules of English to convert that. So it passes the letters to the phonological output buffer. The output buffer is, a, is able to say, all right, here are the consonants. This is probably the stressed one. This is probably a schwa. This is how it should probably be pronounced. You then create the motor plan and say that word. 
by the way. I think it means to walk along casually, similar to bumble, bumble along. That orthographic to phonological conversion is really important for um, people with uh, acquired dyslexia, acquired alexia with aphasia. Uh, so we will come back to that in another video. So what's next is spelling or producing a word. Now this applies to handwriting and typing, but we're going to focus on handwriting because that's what this model is built around. To write a word again, we start in the semantic system. If we know the written word for that, it will light up the orthographic output lexicon. So similarly, it has meaning stored here and the storage of spelling stored here. It will say, yes, we have a word for that. That is then passed to an orthographic output buffer, also called the graphemic output buffer. And this is a little analogous to the phonological assembly or phonological output buffer. It kind of holds those letters for production. So particularly for a long word like um, anthropomorphic, you know, we look up and we say, yes, we have storage for that spelling, but while you sit there and write it out, you kind of need to hold on to it so that you don't keep having to look it up. The next few steps are not in every representation of palpa, but I think they're important because they can be differentially impaired with someone with aphasia. So the next step is graphemic to graphic. What does that mean? It's actually the spatial and visual information for letters. So it's all very well to say, well, that word is spelled, you know, A-N-T-H-R-O, etc. But this kind of shows you the word in your, those letters in your head and how they should look. So a word like Beijing, you know it's B-E-I-J-I-N-G, but this step shows you the correct letters and what they should look like. Similar to the articul articulatory planning, this has to be converted to a motor plan. So this process kind of converts the concepts of letters into movements for the hand, for handwriting and presumably a, a pattern of typing as well, and that is sent off and the word is written. So we've briefly covered word comprehension, word production, reading comprehension and the, the multiple paths, and producing a written word. A couple of bypasses here that we need to know about. The first is from the phonological output lexicon straight to the orthographic output lexicon. So this is for cases where you are writing a word that you know how to say but you don't have any semantic knowledge. Presumably it's a word you are saying out loud, but you're able to recognize from the spoken word that actually, yes, I also know how to spell that word, even though I don't know what it means, and it flows down from there. The other one is phonological to graphemic conversion. And this is for writing words you haven't actually seen before. You can work out how to spell a lot of words just through hearing it, even though you've never seen it written before. How do you do that? Let's use the example of a surname. Someone says, my name is Glentham, and you don't want to ask them how to spell it. You look up your orthographic output lexicon, and unfortunately you don't have an entry because you've never seen it. However, not that hard to spell if you're a proficient English user. So you kind of mentally say it, Glentham, and you convert each of those phonemes into a grapheme, phonological to graphemic conversion. And in that box is kind of the rules of spelling, the rules of written English. You won't get it right every time, but it gives you a good hint. Then you're able to take those letters and write them or type them. And one more sidetrack. What if you are copying out a word that you've never seen before, never seen it written, and you never spelled it yourself before, of course, so there's no entry in the output lexicons. Well, you can still see it on the page. You can understand what the letters are, and you can copy them out. So we've got this orthographic to graphemic conversion. Now you can also visually copy something, right? Like if you were given, um, you know, a language you don't speak, say you're given Chinese characters, you can copy them out visually, but it's very slow because you're doing it line for line. Whereas if someone just flushes a word up at you in handwriting, you could type that out because you are converting the abstract concept of the letters here to a string of letters here, and then you are programming them and producing them. For example, this word comma, this is not an English word, but because they're English letters, you would only need to see that for a split second and you can convert those into written letters. 
And the last thing we haven't looked at is visual input. Um, the reason this is important is because we can look at you know any given object in our world, or I guess actions and concepts, and we visually recognise the object. You know, strictly speaking, that's probably not a linguistic concept. However, the features that we are seeing light up in the semantic system and tell us what that object is. So we look at something, you know, let's say we look at a hospital, we see that's a big building, uh, it has a red cross on it, um, there are sick people coming in and out, our semantic system is lit up and that tells us that is a hospital. And then we can, if we choose, say the word or spell the word out. So in fact, you could also, you know, theoretically create an input for hearing. You can recognize sounds and you can label those sounds or any sensory input. But visual is most important um, for our purposes. All right, you now have an introduction to each of these boxes and each of these arrows. I just want to acknowledge the sources of um, where I revised my information and clarified what I was going to say about each area. Nichols here is an introductory kind of text on how this works, particularly for the spoken output. Uh, the Palpa kit itself has an introductory little chapter, which is also a really approachable introduction to it. And this Whitworth textbook is just like your Bible for using Palpa. I highly recommend it. It goes through not only how it works, but the impairments, the therapies with uh, lots of citations of research and examples. It's just an excellent textbook for this uh, approach. Okay, that's the explanation. If you haven't got it on your first go, don't worry. Just go back and, and look at the parts uh, from where you don't understand or you, you've got lost and also have a look at those readings. Even preparing the materials for this video, I had to go back and look things up because it's maybe been a long time since I've looked at that part or I misunderstood. So, you know, it is a complex system. Let's get into some test questions and this will give you an idea of whether you do understand it or, or there's more work to do. All right, first of all, what do you do when you are recognizing and understanding the spoken word salami? So it's a word that most people know. Therefore you hear the word, you understand the phonemes, you recognize the word in your input lexicon and you're also able to connect it to the features of that concept. Second, what process, and by process this could be a path or it could be a single box or like a, you know, part of a pathway. What process is distinguishing written letters from someone's messy handwriting? So what process do you use to look at this and understand what the letters are? When grandma writes you a card, it takes you a few minutes, right? How do you do it? So you do it by, you have a visual input from the print and you use visual orthographic analysis. Even though that handwriting might be loopy or messy, you're able to pull out what the letters should be. What about hearing a word that you recognize but you don't understand? So in this case, it's the same pathway, but when it gets to the input lexicon, you recognize it because it's in your lexicon. It's a word you've heard before, but you don't know what it means. You don't understand it. And so it just stops there. Reading aloud a non-word. Let's say this word. How do you read that aloud? How do you know that that says strayed when you've never seen it before? Okay, you read aloud a non-word by understanding the letters nothing happens in the input lexicon because you don't you haven't seen that word before but you're able to use letter to sound rules to assemble the sound of it and then program that and say it what about writing the name of an image so written confrontation naming so if i say write down the name of this You do that by recognizing what the object is and that will light up the semantic system which tells you, ah, we've got a word for this and the best word, the closest word, or I guess the word that most strongly lights up is taco. And it has a T and an A and a C and an O. So hold on to them. The letters look like this. Please turn that into a motor plan and then you write it or perhaps type it. Okay, 
what happens when you repeat aloud a word from an unfamiliar language? So if we ask you to repeat a Russian word, malako, I bet you can say that exactly the same. What you're doing repeating a word from an unfamiliar language, that's an example of an unknown word. Presumably you haven't heard it before and you haven't said it before, so it's not in your lexicons and you don't know what it means. So the process is this, we recognize the phonemes, we convert those into phonological or phonemes to be pronounced. We assemble that back into a plan, motor plan, and then we say it. What about reading aloud a word that you know, but you don't understand? So, you know, you can start by looking at where it won't go. It won't go to the semantic system because you don't know what it means. But if you recognize that it, it's in your input lexicon. So it goes orthographic analysis, input lexicon, bypasses the semantic system. Presumably you've uh, said it before. That's a bit of an assumption in this question. Then you assemble it and say it. And what about writing down a spoken word that you've never heard before? So I'm asking you to copy down a word and I just make up a word. So in this case, it's not in the semantic system. It's not in any of your lexicons. So what does that leave us with? So you understand the phonemes if it's in a language you speak. You convert them into a phonological, like a spoken plan, and you sound it out slowly to yourself use the rules, convert that into letters, and produce those letters onto paper or screen. Okay, last one. What is it when you just say a word out of your own head? You decide to say the word poodle for some reason. People get tripped up on this because there's no input in this case. It's coming from your own brain. So it starts at the semantic system, it retrieves the, you know, you say, I'm thinking of this animal and it's fluffy and it's got, this is my dog, by the way, and it's got, it's got curly fur and it says, yep, there's a word for that. Here it is. You assemble it and you say it. So it starts in the semantic system and it ends up as speech. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, the next video will look at what happens when this system uh, is damaged or not functioning properly. What are the symptoms we see in language processing? So. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then.